So let me introduce Wout, Wout van Hout. Wout is my meter stick. 50 years ago, Wout would have been used as a formative feedback tool by teachers to if you didn't meet our expectations. Nowadays, I'm only using it to stop me from wandering about the stage. And there's a pointer, OK? And it's funny to think how how our perception has evolved, how our norms have changed in 50 years. It used to be acceptable and commonplace to hit a child with a stick. Now it's illegal. So it makes me think, how have we evaluated our change over time? And how can we rethink the purpose of education for the 21st century and bring about meaningful change? So I'm Jordan White, I lead classes here in chemistry, career guidance and science, and I invite you on a little journey here. So why do we need to change it? That implies that it's broken. It, does it need fixed? Well, if you look around the world, most of the world's leaders are educated people. And yet we have a world that is ravaged by war, climate disaster, and competition for depleting resources. Competition is part of the problem. Greed is not good. And COP26 happened recently in Glasgow, my part of the world. But the leaders ended up making COP stand for carry on procrastinating. And very little meaningful change happened. And that's because the actors in this meeting, they have too much to lose. They have vested interests in the status quo. So how can we produce people to meet the demands of today? Not by getting back to normal, not by doing things the way we did it before. Yeah, COVID was very bad and continues to be bad. It's been a disaster in many ways, but it's a wonderful opportunity for learning, a wonderful opportunity for reflection. It gave us license to do things in different ways and to reflect on our own practice. For example, I think about how I assess people now, and I ask myself, if I can't trust you to not cheat with a test, what does it say about what I'm asking you to do? Is it meaningful? So another thing that, about COVID as well is that many people dislike the online learning, but it's because there's that synonymous with isolation and the lack of community. So can we improve the future? by doing things the way we did before? Perhaps not, but how can we change it? Well, it's you that's going to need to do it, and you need to have an environment where you're able to do that. So I asked the question, what's the purpose of education? What's the why of it? And I, came to, I thought about this for a long time, and my conclusion was, it's to make the world a better place. Simple as that, okay? You cannot argue with that. And once you launch from that purpose, forward as opposed to the assessment backwards, then we can look at the how and what of how school should look. I proposed this very question to some of my S5 students through career guidance. And here is how they responded. The old man is me. So the purpose of school is to do well in your exams so you get good grades, a good job, get to a good university, make your parents happy. It's a bit bleak. So the, pers the purpose of school is the measurement of school. The biggest word in the word cloud for that question was parents, which is interesting. And it also makes us think, what is a grade? A grade is a value judgment. Do all value judgments have value? What skills should you have? What kind of people do we want to raise to develop? Do we want people who reflect society? Or do we want people who have certain qualities and values? We need to nurture and promote these values. What should you learn? I always think that if you, people get distracted when they're doing things they're not interested in. If things are interesting to you, you will go in much greater depth. You don't need to be average at everything. But you decided, or S5 decided, that math, science, and languages, important subjects, were what you needed to learn. There's this hierarchy of education. It's, it's nonsense, but it exists, and it's always the same. We never say 
to the kid who's really good at maths, put down your protractor, pick up a badminton racket and get outside. The opposite's true. And the final one, well, it's a bit of a difficult question because the transactional didactic learning that you experience in class is what you're used to. And that massively changed in March, April 2020. So you perhaps didn't have a huge frame of reference. But some of you liked online learning or you liked bits of it. We're quick to dismiss that. There was much that we could learn from it. OK, so what else can we learn from this apart from you thinking or the S5 thinking that the purpose of, assess or the purpose of school is assessment? What if there's no exams then? What happens? Does school lose its purpose? Well, it does if you think it's just a sorting mechanism for universities. But we continued. Your parents went to work. We looked after you. That was part of our purpose. We didn't lose purpose. We continued. And it made me reflect, is the purpose of school assessment and the last part of school simply a sorting system, an accountable and measurable sorting system for universities? Is this the right way around? Is university requests, are they, wagging the tail, are they the tail wagging the dog of school design? I, I don't know. And I ask myself every day, am I part of the problem? If I'm coaching you towards an exam and not doing something that I perceive to be meaningful, I'm just perpetuating a noble lie. So are it, do, do exams make the world a better place? Will they make the world a fairer place, according to some, okay? A more meritocratic place. But is it fair that your life chances are determined by how you perform in exams age 16 or 17? A three week window, and that determines your choices forever. Standardized exams in often cases. And really what they're doing is they're asking, who gets which pathway, who goes where? It's like a sorting system. We need to decouple that. School needs to be school in its own end, not for the purpose of university. Brands are things like Oxford or Ivy League. Okay, they look good to other people, okay, but they are just places. They're just learning institutions, like school. And you ask the question, are high stakes exams? We want to promote lifelong learning, but if you've got a high stakes exam, you have to cram for that exam. That's not lifelong learning. That's learning for a purpose and then forgetting about it. I don't know how many times I've done that in my life. I'm past that now, and I'm very, I'm very grateful for it. But our school system continues to perpetuate it. Not just our school system, all school systems. Most school systems. So why, why do we need fairness anyway? Well, it's because of the value. It's because of what the access that these exam scores give you. They give you access to pathways. And they tend to go, it tends to be the same kind of things that are rewarded all the time. They give people pathways to exclusive places. But is exclusivity good? Exclusivity is based on exclusion, cutting people out. We don't need to do that anymore. Why are we excluding people? Right? I didn't get into education to help one person in 10. But that is the kind of metric that universities love because it boosts their ranking. If they say that we exclude lots of people, then they're seen as desirable, supply and demand. We don't need to do it anymore. The internet has democratized education in many ways. It's more accessible. That means fewer people should feel left behind. More people can be included and we can stop fueling the fires of populism, which is ultimately perpetuated by those who are left behind. So conservative choices are often made as well. They're part of the problem. If you make a conservative choice based on how it looks rather than what it is, then what you're doing is you're perpetuating the system as it is now. You are auditioning to be part of the establishment, not to reshape it, okay? which is another reason why we need to rethink the purpose. And if that competitiveness and branding, so if Oxford and Oxford Brooks, Leeds and Leeds Beckett, if they were the same thing and they didn't appear on an application form like your age or your sex, then 
that whole mystique, that competitiveness can fall by the wayside. And perhaps we'll get along a little better as well. Because when competitiveness goes up, kindness goes down. And is our meritocratic system responsible for the rise of populism? It's a deeper question. But those who are left behind by our education system are those who perpetuate populism. And those who do well from it are often those who exploit it. OK, so thank you. <laughs> so the limits of positivism, I'm a science teacher. I love to measure everything. I like to think that most things can be measured. But in truth, they can't. In truth, they can't, OK? So I love to do a little graph to say, if your knee is higher, then you're less productive. I like to see one thing as a function of another. But that's not always useful in education. We cannot measure everything, and it's not useful to do so. The more quantitative our system is, the more it can be gamed. So we look at things like SATs in America and university entry exams, personal statements here. These are all things that people can be coached to be better at, but only if you've got the money to hire that person who knows how to do it. So what happens is academic attainment tracks wealth and nothing changes. Is it more important to get an A or a 10 than to be good at the subject? And they're not the same thing. When the metric becomes more important than the learning itself, then the metric is not fit for purpose. OK? Why am I mentioning China? <laughs> um, PISA scores are things that people who do educational policies love to refer to. They love to say things like, oh, if we came in 20 minutes earlier in the morning and did 15 minutes of reading, will our literature, literacy scores go up? Let's measure it and try and find out. But ultimately, PISA tests are standardized tests. The way you get good at doing a standardized test is doing more standardized tests. Okay? And are we willing to sacrifice what some of these kids have to sacrifice to get there. And for if so, for what? For what purpose? It's low-hanging fruit. It really is. Um, so I've kind of bashed the sort of quantitative system of education that we have. So what do we need to replace it? Well, we kind of need a story, because it's, it's stories that shape the zeitgeist. It's stories that um, influence our choices. It's not facts, it's not data. Brexit showed that. So let's base it on fundamental values. Collaboration over competition. Instead of competing with each other to see who gets the best grades, who gets whatever, then how about you work together? Creativity tends to be an emergent idea. It's something that comes through interaction. Solutions come from interaction. They don't come, as is often depicted, from the guy sitting in the corner in the dark and then the light bulb comes on. That's rare. It tends to be that ideas come from working together. And if we can work together, perhaps we'll fight a little less. Perhaps we should value what people are good at rather than measuring what their deficiencies are. That's pretty self-evident. But as competition and competitiveness goes up, these tend to go down. Okay, Every person for themselves. And personalized lifelong learning. There's a lot in, that th in those three words. But basically, it's the fundamental idea that you can learn at your own pace subjects that interest you. Some people can go a lot faster than the treadmill. Others need it to slow down a little. So do we measure these things? Are these, we can't do an exam in kindness. How, I've got a seven for kindness, sir. Well, how can I get an eight? Well, that's not particularly helpful. It's not a useful metric. But we can develop it, we can nurture it. Sorry. When you look at plans for schools, they quite often are in boxes, rectangles, tables. And it's like a machine. And if it's not in rectangles, it tends to be a useless graphic. So learning's more like a dance between people than a machine. You are not cogs, you're not gears. So Perhaps we need to think about how we design school in that way, as opposed to engineering defined outcomes, as opposed to open questions. Because those defined outcomes, they act as more of a ceiling than a floor for your ability. 
And wouldn't it be nice if there was a story that was told about you at the end of school and not just a number? So are all metrics useful? Sometimes they're really not. If I want to go and buy a new car, I might want something that's comfortable. I don't care how fast it goes if I drive in the town. Right? So why would I choose it based on its top speed? So that other people know that I've got a fast car? So what should you learn when you're in school? This, I think we should ask you, because a few years ago, lots of you left the school and went and walked in the streets. And you said that we weren't teaching you enough about climate change. And we weren't listening to your demands. And I'll be honest, I felt very uncomfortable as the person saying, no, you should come to school and not take part in this enormous activity of citizenship education. You should learn about it in a classroom. So what we should do is we should really be designing this with you, not for you. Okay, you should be responsible for what you learn. And then you're an actor in your own learning. You're not just a recipient. Okay? What about subjects then? Oh, if we're going to learn about climate change, who'll teach me it? Will it be the science teacher? Will it be the economics, the geography teacher? Who'll do it? Well, what are subjects anyway? Right? They're lines drawn in the sand that the winds of time will blow away. Right? The only reason we have subjects is because we need to be able to teach you content that we're experts in. But to be honest, this knowledge and content is easily accessible now. Knowledge is now pretty cheap. So what about the teachers? Teachers are uncomfortable teaching you things that they don't know a lot about, but we don't need to know more than you. In fact, if you take someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, he does Jose Mourinho was his coach. Jose Mourinho has never been a professional footballer, yet he was able to coach a guy who was arguably one of the best players in the world because he was able to tell him how he could improve. And that's how I see our role, is to help you improve. It's not to know more than you. I think it's brilliant if you know more than me, frankly. So you need to be part of the, the design, part of the idea. But you should work with us. It shouldn't be a rebellion. It shouldn't be either or. Perhaps we should collaborate and do this together. So on to the last part then. The, the last thing I want to say is if we can change, if we can keep purpose at the forefront and do as we like in schools, then there needs to be a decoupling from assessment and university entry. Now, some people will say, ah, but if you couple the university entry with the assessment, that means it's gets rid of corruption because then you're based on a number and it gives people who come from poorer backgrounds an escape route. Our society shouldn't be predicated on escape for a start, right? But there must be a better way of doing it and the discussion has to be had. And instead of like justifying our position, defending our inertia, we need to accept our fallibility, recognize flaws within the secondary to university transition and base it on values. We need people who can make changes, not perpetuate the current system, all right? You need to be able to think and act differently from me. I am part of the problem. So you might think, that's all great, Mr. White, but I'm a victim in this system. What can I do, right? And you'd be true. You'd be right to some point. But one thing you can do is prioritize what you're learning over how it's measured. Don't ask your teacher how you can get a better grade. Ask your teacher, what am I not getting here? How can I improve? Okay, what, can, what am I not getting? That's what you need to focus on, not the grades. Share your ideas with other adults. We're your equals, right? Just because we're more qualified than you um, in terms of the quality, we're older as well. You should, we should be part of a community, not I'm the big man who knows it and you're the little person who doesn't. Do new things outside of school as well. It really does broaden how you think. And by that, I mean, try new things, learn differently, do things. School is only a small part of your learning. We, we play a role in that. The home plays a role in it. Your friends, other interests do as well. So if we want to reimagine the purpose, all people need to get out the way and help you along the way. And the final thing, stay humble because you never know your greatest teacher might be the person that comes from where you least expect it. So thanks for your attention and have a wonderful day.